talk today, we're talking about contract manufacturing and white label production in the cannabis industry. While contract manufacturing might be on the rise here in, in, in cannabis, it's been around in CPG and traditional conventional consumer packaged goods for many decades. Uh, personally, I've got a friend that's family business goes back to the late 1800s when they started their operation and producing all different types of goods. Um, and to this day are still producing those similar types of goods for conventional consumer packaged goods businesses. So let's talk about contract manufacturing and white label production in cannabis. Personally, I first saw this model come to market in Colorado back in the you know, 2016, 2017. And it really was brought in through the concentrate and extraction facilities. In essence, they were toll processing for cultivators, retailers, and packaging the product up underneath that cultivator or retailer's label, also known as white label production. I didn't see um, edible production really take off in Colorado, um, at, at least back in that same time period. It was, it was California where I started to see contract manufacturing of um, more, I would say, infused products. And you know, we saw that with some large scale operations that were built in California. There were a couple of ways that people fell into contract manufacturing, I would say, which, you know, you go back to that toll processing of concentrates and extracts. A lot of those folks actually had their own brands, but what they found is that they had excess capacity on, on that machinery. And in, in an effort to, you know, cover their cost of operations, they would then start to produce for other concentrate uh, labels. So first path was the, you know, falling into it with excess capacity. Um, you know, second path was really the the idea of, hey, let's build a business just to manufacture. We're not gonna have our own cannabis brands or labels. We're just gonna be that service partner. And we've seen that model evolve a lot over the last few years. I'd say, you know, really in the, you know, since 2020, I've seen a lot more emphasis on the contract manufacturing segment. There are three core buyers um, for the capacity to contract contract manufacturers have. So that's your asset light brand, which in essence is really just a sales and marketing business. That's your retail or dispensary operator who would like to private label their own products for their consumers. And then your craft cultivator, and that's somebody who um, you know, is selling their, their A buds as flour, but has uh, residual materials that they wanna turn in and you know, really be able to create value from, in which case maybe they're blowing out concentrates or vape or making edibles. So let's first talk about the asset light brand. This is not a new model by any means. It might be, you know, relatively new in the cannabis industry, given that, you know, we're a young industry, but having worked in emerging CPG for the last 15 years, this is the primary model that innovative entrepreneurs lean in and leverage. Why? Well, you know, startup cost. You can build a scrappy, lean business um, without having to take on you know private investment because really you're becoming a sales and marketing entity and maybe you have a team member or two and you find a manufacturing partner who's going to produce your products for you where you just buy what you need yeah they might have minimums five ten thousand units maybe it's twenty or thirty thousand dollars but as an asset like brand you can be in the market for call it under 30k even with packaging um, we can talk about that at a later point, however it helps you do that as an asset light brand. Um, but you know, 30K to get a brand to market versus all the OPEX and CAPEX that comes along with building your own facility, which is a multi-million dollar investment. When we look at things like you know, craft beverage, um, you know, pet treats, natural foods, sports nutrition, a lot of the top performing brands today do not own their own manufacturing. They launched with contract manufacturers and they continue to utilize contract manufacturers, which enables them to really hyper-focus on what they do best. And that's, you know, capturing market share, building community, and ultimately developing a loyal um, base of consumers. It's also a great way to scale. Um, you have a lot of challenges when you're building your own operation that if you haven't done it before, um, can be really overwhelming when it comes to not being able to keep up with the demand. Whereas working with a contract manufacturer who specializes in the production of the widgets that you're having them make, they have a deep bench of talent. They have more than one line. So they have redundancy in their operation. This is what they do for a living. 
Personally, I would encourage anybody who's thinking about building a brand in cannabis that doesn't currently own assets to first look at an asset light model and then really play devil's advocate and understand and justify why they think they should acquire the license for an operation or the, the machinery and the personnel that come along with building your own operation. Having personally built um, you know, multiple manufacturing plants and being a sales and marketer at heart, uh, I would do everything I could to build my brand and not have to take on the liability with my own operation. That's what we're doing at Vert today. We're an asset medium business, and um, I'm happy to talk with anybody about that too. So that's asset light brand. Let's talk about retailer. Retailer is retail is a hyper competitive segment. You know, fighting for the same consumers in the same area, um, it, it's a challenge, right? So what are you doing to differentiate? And I think how you set up your retail environment, how you're building your own community, listening to that community and what their needs and desires are, are all factors for how you continue to build a repeat customer and somebody that ultimately is coming back to your shop versus somebody else's. We've seen folks take you know, their own approaches to that with maybe building more of that hangout space at their dispensary where their, their, their community comes in, they buy their products, but they also might hang and sesh for a little bit. We've also seen a really big uptick in retailers private labeling their own products where they have consumers that trust the retail brand. They're now bringing them their own you know, trusted label on a vape or an edible, uh, maybe even flour. You know, as a retailer, you might be buying flour on the open market that you've gone out, you've inspected, you know the quality, you know the producer, but you're branding it underneath your label. Obviously, every market has its own challenges, and depending on the market, you know there are things you can and can't do. That being said, both out west in California, we've seen a major push of retailers doing you know their own branded products in order to capture margin, own that consumer, make more money, um, and and compete. Funny enough, um, that same thing is happening out east, right? You know, Massachusetts uh, is a market where I'm starting to see more of that take place. It happens here in Colorado. So th this isn't a new, um, it, it's it's not a, a brand new concept, but it's a trend that as somebody who's working in a bunch of different markets, I see evolving and gaining more and more momentum. That last part, as I mentioned, is you know being a craft cultivator and you know really focusing on your expertise, your craft, which is tending to the plants, you know, pulling down beautiful buds, doing your pheno hunts, creating limited and unique experiences for your consumers, creating that that hunt that you're doing internally, but for the consumer who's constantly waiting for that next drop. Doing that at the top of the game requires complete focus, right? You know, being able to make, um, you know, in a concentrate product, a vape product, an edible, and then taking on the liability that comes along with now having more assets, more people, it, it really isn't, it, it's hard to justify. Whereas, You've got plenty of potential partners in your market that you know have the assets, have available capacity, that you can find folks that you can build a relationship with and trust, build an equitable relationship where everybody can eat together and the consumer ultimately feels that they're getting a top-notch product for the price that they're paying. Why wouldn't a craft cultivator look to take their you know, BC grade and capitalize on repackaging that up underneath another product that a consumer might want? Um, we know vapes are back with a vengeance and the demand for them is growing. The up and coming consumer wants convenience. I think you know we're gonna continue to see shift of demand as consumer evolves, as consumer matures, as younger generation comes up. And utilizing contract manufacturers as a way to expand your portfolio, um, being a craft cultivator, is a great way to capture more market share, uh, potentially new consumers, um, you know, really expand your presence within the within your community and ultimately a great way for you to drive value at the bottom line. All of these things roll up to, to help contract manufacturers fill their capacity. And when we look at where the industry is heading, um, you know, this is a, a consumer packaged good. It's no different than the other categories I mentioned, be it sports nutrition, beverage, food, pet, cosmetics. And when you look at those industries, they're powered by contract manufacturing. The reason for that is cost of production unit economics, um, consumers who still are gonna put pressure on quality product at a competitive price. As cannabis markets mature, 
these same factors become reality. They're here in, in a market like Colorado or California. They're coming for a market like New York, which is just in its infancy stage. So the ability to have margins in the market that support an operation that's only utilizing its equipment for 30, 40%, that model does not work in a mature market, which is why contract manufacturing ultimately will power a large portion of the brands we see on shelf. Same reasoning behind consumers who ultimately want brought brands and products that align with their values, which creates diversification proliferation on shelf. So as we have more SKUs in market, more brands, more products, it ultimately means not everybody can sit there and have their own operation. That demand really needs to be pooled and produced by a centralized manufacturer. Add in the fact that state, you know, the ability to cross borders and state lines with product will come to the market at some point. Yeah, you'll see that multi-state brands will have their own manufacturing operations, but the reality is, is that you will have lots of operators who are utilizing um, you know, a contract manufacturer out west to maybe expand their presence on the west coast because the cost of actually launching that market and doing so is really not all that great when you go that asset light route. That's a lot here packed on today's vlog. Um, you know, this is certainly an area we'll be talking more about. If you are considering utilizing a contract manufacturer to expand your brand, offering your portfolio of products, you're looking to launch your product into the market here in, in um, you know, record time, you're looking to test the market and not have a ton of money up front to really have product on shelf, that's what we're doing here at Vert. We're enabling you to take a concept and idea to market in record speed and a fraction of the traditional cost, validate that idea and ultimately be able to call and say, hey, I need more product um, or I need more packaging and I need to hear in two weeks because the market's quickly seeing the fact that they like what I have to offer. So keep us in the back of your mind, reach out if you have any questions. We'll look forward to catching up with you on the next vlog.